In the meantime, I pasted our YouTube channel link. Not every presentation is in English, but uh, you can see what happened before on our meetups, and you can subscribe if you if you like. This uh, meetup also will be presented on our YouTube channel. That's why we are recording this. Hey, one minute left. Grzegorz, I think you can slowly start. The first minutes will be your introduction, so I think you can start right now. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's cool. So, um, yeah, let me introduce myself first. My name is Grzegorz Bizon and I work at GitLab as a backend engineer um, for the last five years, I've been focusing on making GitLab CI better. And today I would like to uh, tell you what continuous integration actually is, uh, what you can do to benefit from the practice and how easy it actually might be uh, to use continuous integration with GitLab. Um, before we start, I'm, I'm Sorry in advance for all the background noise you might hear during the presentation. You know, we are working from home so uh, these days and uh, this can happen. So I hope you don't mind. So is that okay to start with uh, with slides? Yes, sure. Okay, cool. So the first slide is a definition. A definition that I like, uh, although it's not very self-explanatory. So basically, continuous integration is a software development practice where code is integrated frequently. And that's a good definition as long as you know what it actually means to integrate software. And um, if you are using a source version control system like Git, um, you might be already familiar with this workflow. You basically integrate your changes, your features, your bug fixes into a master branch. And in, in Git, it's a main line, right? So it, then you are going to perhaps deploy your master branch somewhere and uh, your changes are going to land uh, in the production environment. And um, basically the idea behind continuous integration is to do that frequently. You are supposed to 
merge small incrementation increments of your changes into a master branch and you are supposed to do that uh, frequently so ideally it should happen several times a day uh, if there is more than one team members of course working on the uh, on uh, on your uh, software mm. and if you are integrating your changes into a master branch that often it's usually a good idea to actually automate your checks in a way that you are not going to see problems on your master branch because other people are going to derive their branches from your changes and uh, are going to actually use your code so it's good to actually ensure that it's not broken and because of that uh, continuous integration has become an industry synonym for continuous testing because you are supposed to actually run automated tests before you merge something into your master branch because this way you can basically be relatively confident that your changes are not going to break something. So on the slide, you can actually uh, see a very first GitLab QA test. And um, that test is something we have written, uh, we wrote a, lot, a long time ago, uh, something that actually allows us uh, to check whether signing in into GitLab works before we deploy new code into the production. We sometimes run end-to-end uh, -end tests uh, uh, in a different way. Let me make a pause here because I need to suppress the background noise <laughs> a little bit. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'll be back in like a moment. OK, no problem. Where is the Yeah, I'm sorry for that. It's a bit of a struggle <laughs> these days. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the presentation. So uh, the end-to-end -end test. As you can see, it's quite simple. It's an RSpec test that on the main page of GitLab is going to sign in using credentials. And uh, we expect to see uh, a banner that you have successfully signed in into GitLab. So that's a test. And uh, you are supposed to have a lot of them. All right? can you hear me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, that's an end-to-end -end test. Sometimes we refer to such kind of tests as UI tests and uh, naming. And we are supposed to have different kinds of tests. Uh, the most important ones are, of course, unit tests, and they are very important because uh, unit tests are extremely fast and cheap to run. Ideally, you should have thousands of them, and you should be able to run them within a second or two. Of course, that's a little bit more complex in big projects. In big projects, you have a lot of unit tests, and uh, sometimes you need to parallelize their execution. But I'm going to tell you more about that in a moment. So that's uh, the bottom of the test testing pyramid. And uh, it's testing pyramid that you can see on the slide. And it's very useful heuristic to understand uh, how to categorize our tests and um, whether our testing practice is actually sane. So uh, in the middle, you see a service layer. Um, sometimes we refer to these tests as feature tests, system tests, on, or integration tests. They usually, usually uh, have a little uh, broader coverage, uh, not only just a unit like a class or a function, but sometimes we are also making it possible to test integration with database uh, or with uh, some um, more than just you know a unit it's it's more like it's database uh, it's uh, it exercises uh, just broader scope at the top of the pyramid uh, these are ui tests sometimes we refer to them as end to end tests and these tests are usually quite brittle uh, very expensive to run uh, so if you would like to keep your testing suit sane you shouldn't have too many of them um, and you should rely on unit and service tests uh, a lot as well. 
So that's a very interesting heuristic, in my opinion. Uh, if you uh, invert the pyramid, for example, you have very few unit tests, some amount of service tests, but you rely on, uh, on almost solely on end-to-end -end tests, your testing practice is not going to be very efficient. It's going to be expensive. You are going to see a lot of flaky results and transient failures in your pipelines, and it's going to like be a struggle to uh, change that. And people eventually might even abandon testing because of not having uh, this you know, healthy testing pyramid. So uh, yeah, so you know now uh, what a test is, um, what continuous integration is, and uh, how you can actually use GitLab to run your tests, and uh, how can you understand the result of your tests before you accept the merge request. So in, in GitLab, it's quite simple. Uh, on, in a merge request, which is a request to merge and integrate some chunk of changes, a feature of bug fix or something that you have written in the uh, last days, right? Uh, uh, in the merge request, we, we can see a result of your tests running, how it actually works. I'm going to uh, show you in a minute. But what matters right now is that you can easily see a result and uh, you can be confident that all the tests are passing. And if you are a maintainer of a project, a reviewer, you can just confidently hit accept merge request button. And this is going to integrate your changes into the master branch. So uh, is that going to help us? How is that going to help us? Is that going to be the uh, silver bullet and ultimate solution to perhaps bugs? Uh, so that's a very interesting question. And uh, engineers that have this experience of working with legacy code uh, can probably relate to this GIF. Um, sometimes when you are working in a very large project uh, without tests, without testing, without continuous integration practice, um, you want to fix something. And then suddenly after deployment to production environment, you want to discover uh, 10 new bugs that your changes has caused, of course, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's a problem uh, when you don't have tests. But testing and continuous integration practice, uh, it, it's it's not going to help you uh, that much. It's definitely not going to result in having no bugs. Um, the man on the image on the photo it's it's her Digixtra, and uh, that's a very important person uh, because this is one of the first programmers ever, a person who actually uh, put a foundation. Uh, under current programming. Um, if you are familiar with structural programming, and I'm sure you are because right now almost every language, programming language uh, is using the principles from structural programming. Uh, this is the person that devised it. And uh, he said that testing shows the presence, not the absence of bugs. And that's, uh, I, I like that, qu that quote. It tells us that uh, we are writing tests uh, to show uh, correctness uh, of our application but it, by failing to prove that it's incorrect. So in other words, um, in other words, uh, it, it means that our code can be proven incorrect by a fail failing test, but cannot be proven correct by entire entire test suite uh, of tests passing. So this is this is uh, important because it basically explains that it's not possible uh, to build a bug-free software even though you have hundreds of millions of test cases. So testing is not going to uh, help you uh, to produce a bug-free software, but testing is much it's it's uh, much more than just reducing the amount of de defects. Right, so Mar Martin Fowler said that continuous integration doesn't get rid of bugs, but it does make them uh, dramatically easier to find and remove. So actually, it means that um, um, it 
it it means that um, removing reducing the amount of defects is an outcome. It's not the purpose. Uh, testing and continuous integration can help with that, but uh, continuous integration has much more much broader impact on your project than just this. Uh, so yeah, let's go back to GitLab. Uh, how does it work with GitLab? So you know that you have you need tests. You need to have a lot of them. You need to have unit tests, system tests, end-to-end -end tests, but they need to run somewhere, right? It's it's a code that needs to be executed. So at, at GitLab, uh, you keep your tests in a repository. You configure your CI configuration. You also store store it in a repository, and then GitLab, uh, it, it's going to uh, uh, start uh, a bunch of machines with uh, a GitLab runner. GitLab runner is a very interesting piece of a software. It's a Golang-based application that is going to connect to GitLab. It's going to fetch your source code and it's going to fetch uh, your configuration of your uh, CI, um, you know, uh, CI configuration for your project. And then it's going to run all the tests in your project and report results back to GitLab so that these are visible for you in the merge request widget. Um, uh, sometimes you might want to parallelize your tests. Uh, sometimes you have millions of them. And uh, sequentially, it would take months for you to execute all of them. But you can employ a Kubernetes. You can employ Docker. You can heavily parallelize everything. And suddenly, instead of running tests for a week, uh, you can get results in a matter of minutes. Um, and uh, in a moment, I'm, I'm going to try to demo uh, doing that in GitLab from scratch. We are going to create a new project. We are going to uh, write some code and push it to GitLab and hopefully see that everything works or not. Um, uh, everything I'm going to show you is uh, free open source software. Although we are doing that on GitLab.com, which is Enterprise Edition, you can do exactly the same thing by uh, installing GitLab on your own infrastructure. You can download GitLab Community Edition. Um, that's a free software. GitLab Runner is also a, a free open source software, MIT licensed. So everything I'm, I'm going to show you here, you can also do on your own infrastructure. Uh, so demo. And uh, yeah, so that it's time for you to open your popcorn, put your sunglasses on, and wait until something breaks. Uh, demoing uh, st stuff like this live, uh, something usually goes wrong. Uh, I remember doing that a couple of years ago when a colleague of mine actually removed the production database on gitlow.com, and we had to restore it for a couple of hours. So, uh, so let's see. Hopefully, today everything is going uh, to be fine. So let's see. So I need to open a terminal. So I need to hit escape here. I need to. Uh, I need to open a new terminal, make a font a little bigger. Okay, can you see the terminal? Yes, we can see, but you can put also a little bigger font. Something yeah, like... I think that one is, is good. Okay, let's try and, uh, okay. So let's go to GitLab. We are going to create a new project. We are going to create a new project, uh, Torum GitLab Day Demo. OK. I'm going to make it a public project and initialize it with README so it's easier to clone it. Uh, OK, so that's, that's a new project. It's empty. It only has README. So let's try to clone it, and let's go to uh, the TMP directory, and let's clone it with uh, this command. OK. As you can see, there is only readme there. So um, uh, 
I, I usually write code in, in Go and in Ruby. I, I think that today we are going to use Ruby. Um, it, it should be quite simple. But let's, let's see if it works. So first of all, we need, we need to initialize our testing harness. Uh, in, in case of Ruby, our spec, it's, it's quite like popular. There are other frameworks like Minitest, uh, or you can even write plain Ruby. And uh, let's start with a class. Mm. Let's make it car RB. Class car, and yeah, that's an empty task, uh, empty class. Let's write a new test for it, uh, car spec RB. Mm. Let's load the source. And let's try to follow test-driven development technique. So we are going to write uh, a few tests before we actually write code. And then we are going to see uh, how it works. It, it shouldn't. So it, uh, if, if, we are, if we run a test without implementation, it's going to obviously fail. Describe ignite and uh, it starts an engine. Okay, expect subject to equal engine on. So it's going the, the, the method ignite, it, it's going to return a string uh, saying that the engine is on. So that's that's going to be a very simple function, a very simple method. Let's add another one. Perhaps describe color. Mm. OK, so. We do have uh, two unit tests uh, for a class car. The first test is going to check uh, if we can properly ignite the engine. The second test is going to check if uh, the car is actually red. So let's implement these methods. Uh, actually, before we do that, let's run spec and see that it should fail. <clears throat> oh, okay. So we do have two failures. It's uh, quite obvious that it's no method error. It means that these methods are not implemented. Mm. Okay, so let's let's write them. Um, Ignite engine on the color red, and now it should pass. Okay, that's uh, can I move this stuff? No, okay, okay. Our spec you can click on the height you in Polish, Ukraine, yeah. and this one will be not visible. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, so there is a typo. So as you can see, that uh, testing already works. It, it allowed us to catch bug. Uh, I made a typo in the method name. It sh should be ignite. And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, we had two examples and zero failures. So it means uh, that it works. So what what uh, remains uh, for this to work with GitLab is adding a GitLab CI YAML file, and that's a continuous integration configuration that GitLab is going to consume, and eventually a GitLab runner is going to fetch it, retrieve it, and use it to run tests. So let's write it. OK, so that's. Uh, that's the file name, um, and uh, we are using. We are going to use an image called Ruby Alpine. 
And um, the image keyword in this simple YAML file is going to instruct the Dataprunner to use a Docker image called Ruby with a tag Alpine. Uh, I'm using Alpine tag here because it's going to be a little bit faster uh, because it's uh, it's relatively small Docker image. And uh, let's let's add a test job and let's add a script. So first we need to, so the Ruby is going to be installed in the container because we are using the Ruby Docker image. But we also need to install game install rspec and we need to run tests rspec. And that should be it. So let, let's give it a try. Uh, git status, let's add all the files. Mm. Let's commit that at car class and continuous integration config. And we can simply push that to GitLab. Okay, let's go to GitLab. And uh, after the page refresh, uh, the pipeline is already running. It's going to have one test job. As you can see, uh, GitLab Runner uh, is downloading the Ruby Alpine Docker image. And uh, everything seems to work fine. We do have two examples and zero failures. So the test run has been successful. Let's change something. Let's see a failure. It might be interesting. So let's uh, close this and let's break something in the code instead of red. Uh, the car is now white. Mm. Change the car color to white. Mm. Actually, let's let's do that differently. Uh, let's uh, create a new branch, git checkout b, let's, uh, supp let's suppose that the car is supposed to be white, so let's create branch fix my name and then make car white. We can now commit that, change car color to white, and let's push a new branch to GitLab, we are going to open and uh, create a new merge request. Um, the request to integrate our changes uh, into the master branch. So as you can see, uh, there is a new merge request. Indeed, the git div shows that the car color has been changed to white, and that the pipeline failed. Uh, it failed because we had not updated tests, and uh, our tests are fixing this behavior in place. And uh, we need to update them if we want the pipeline to succeed. Uh, so the car is supposed to be white. Uh, fix tests. Pipeline is running. And everything works again. Uh, so now we can go back to the merge request number one in our project and we can merge it.
So hitting the merge back button here is this act of integrating our changes into the main line, into uh, Git master branch. We can now go to repository files. On the master branch, you see that we have car, uh, CI configuration, and uh, that the car is actually white. Uh, so yeah, so as you can see, it's uh, it's you can get started with GitLab CI in a very short period of time. I think that in six or seven minutes, we managed to uh, create a new project, write some code, configure continuous integration, and see pipelines succeeding and failing. Uh, so okay, uh, we need to go back to the presentation then. Present and uh, so that was the demo. I hope that you liked it. Uh, fortunately, nothing went very wrong uh, this time. GitLab survived. No database has been lost. So we can we can move to uh, we can we can proceed with the presentation. And we are almost at the end. Uh, I wanted to give you some advice for getting started with continuous integration. Uh, I think it's very important to start simple. If you are new to GitLab, if you are new to continuous integration practice, you should start simple because testing and continuous integration, it's all like skiing. You need to first learn how to do that before you can go really fast. And I, I've seen people and companies um, starting with uh, testing in large projects and uh, it usually uh, creates some friction uh, you can spend a lot of time uh, mastering the craft of writing tests. And that's the reason why people believe that writing tests is actually going to slow down, and that's not necessarily true, uh, uh, but things are not that simple. And, and then um, uh, uh, we were uh, writing code in, in the demo project using test-driven development practice. And these days, for example, in Hacker News, you can uh, find a lot of articles like test-driven development considered harmful. And uh, I, I think I do not entirely agree with uh, articles like that because test-driven development is a tool. You usually choose the right tool for a job, right? When you are trying to put a nail into a wood, uh, you know that you need to take a hammer and you know that using a hammer is going to be much more efficient than using your fingers because you intimately know your tools. And if you know your tool, you, you know when to use it, what to use it for. And test-driven development, it's a learning tool first. Then it's a design tool. Then it's a productivity tool. And only then it's a testing tool. So you need to know uh, which tool and how uh, to use it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's actually what I wanted to show you regarding the testing and continuous integration. At the end, uh, I was uh, asked to actually prepare a question. So that's the question. If testing cannot prove correctness of your program, how does it help you to improve quality of your software? And I'm really curious uh, what, there is no good answer for that, of course, but I'm curious what your answers are. You can use your microphone or use uh, chats to, to answer the question. We have some gifts for you prepared. So it helps, uh, uh, from my perspective, it looks like it helps uh, to um, uh, to make it possible to keep the um, best practice at bay during the code development. And because of that, it helps uh, uh, produce a working code. I think that's yeah main reason here. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, writing tests uh, actually bring some discipline to uh, uh, to a team. Like engineers that are writing tests are much more disciplined. Um, there are many reasons why. It, actually improves the code. Mm, I, I think that there is the, an important factor is actually decomposition so that writing tests 
allows you to focus on smaller chunks of work. You can uh, fix the behavior in place for some area of your code base and then focus on one area without really being afraid that something is going to break elsewhere. Sometimes uh, writing tests allows you to design your code in a way that is a little bit more decoupled and you can, for example, focus on a separate and isolated module when you are working on it. And this way, through this decoupling and through this focus, uh, it's going to allow you to achieve better results. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean <laughs> in my words. Cool. <laughs> that was a great answer. <laughs> Andrzej, please contact with, with, with us via Meetup, and we'll give you some information how to how to get our gifts, OK? Sure, sure, no problem. That's great. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, answer this question? If not, then I'm happy to actually answer questions that you might have. So the test you script you're writing, what what was that language or so it was a Ruby language. Um ah, so the test for the Ruby are written in Ruby. Yeah, test uh, yeah, exactly. That's usually how, how it looks like. Uh in, in most cases, uh testing frameworks that allow you to exercise your code are being written in the same language as in code, like there are some exceptions, but if you are writing Golang, you are going to write tests in Golang. If you are writing Ruby, you are going to write tests in Ruby. If you are writing PHP, uh, there is PHP unit that is also PHP, right? Any more questions? Okay, no questions. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I hope it, it was useful for you. So uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, back to you, David or Radek. Thank you, Greg, very much. It was very nice and informative. So I think we can go to the next presentation about the security scanning with GitLab. I'm really interested in that part. Yeah, Tatiana, could you could you share your screen? And I think stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. So, Jen Dobry, uh, I will present my screen now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, I can see your screen. Cool. I may ask, do do you see one screen or two? <laughs> Uh, right now, I see your one screen and presentation is visible right now. Okay, cool. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about security scanning and how we can do it with GitLab. But firstly, I want to present myself. Uh, so my name is Tatiana. I am backend developer at GitLab, where I work in a secure stage. Uh, and I'm me and our team is working on security features and I and I'll be talking about this feature today. So I live in Kharkiv, Ukraine, just really like not so far away from Poland. And I'm here today with my dog Darcy, uh, and he was a big inspiration for this presentation, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Uh, a few links, uh, social links uh, from me, so you can challenge me uh, for a game of chess, only chess, or follow me on Twitter, or check my uh, page on GitLab where you can find uh, the, uh, my activity and uh, which security features are our team is developing right now because uh, GitLab is a transparent company and everything uh, is public, so you can check out. So let me just tell you one little story. And uh, let's meet Alice. Uh, she is a lead developer at a company called Good Boy. And uh, he, she and her team uses GitLab. 
And this is Bob, uh, who is a user of Good Boy, and he used this website to hide all of his tweets. And this is Trudy, uh, who actually want to steal all the treats, all the cucumbers that Bob uh, hid uh, hide in the good boy. And one day she actually succeeded and breaks the website and uh, stole everything which is there. And everyone is really sad about it. Uh, Alice and her team, they lost the credibility. Bob lost uh, all his cucumbers. So like this is like disaster. So Alice hired Walter, who is a private uh, investigator and security specialist, and uh, he should help find the bridge and apply security fix. And Alice asked Walter one question. Why is really my code is vulnerable? And she is not alone in this question. Uh, just a few days ago, McAfee uh, issued a new report showing that in uh, this year, where the economy lost uh, nine uh, hundred forty five billions of dollars. And just a few years ago, the sum was uh, less than uh, six uh, hundred billions. So this is huge and the, uh, the, it's growing every year. And this year, 96% uh, of the organization reported security incidents, like big one or small, but this just like uh, astonishing. It was really astonishing for me when I find out because it means that like uh, application security is important. And nowadays when user data, it's kind of like new oil, it's became even more important. So hackers can uh, attack from different factors. Uh, they can uh, make an attack for the hardware, for the, uh, for example, for the phone uh, operation system where your like mobile application is uh, deployed, or um, onto uh, servers where your uh, your application is running, uh, or they can actually use some social engineering tool, tools to get information directly from users but mostly and we'll be talking today about this so uh, the attack vector is software itself and uh, GitLab actually can help you to mitigate these uh, attacks uh, because and uh, this is really re relevant because uh, by statistic four of six top attacks happen on uh, software itself so uh, we actually don't want to do it like nowadays we can't uh, can't afford to do it manually because the application are big like everything is huge and we have no time for just like manually picking uh, things so we need to automate and as uh, we already use uh, uh, continuous integration uh, process to write our like uh, check our test we can actually can use it for scan our application for security. And there are different scanners for it. So uh, the first one is static and dynamic security testing, uh, which actually scan your code for uh, different vulnerabilities that you actually put it there. Uh, second one is dependency scanning and container scanning, uh, which can help find vulnerabilities in the uh, packages that you use or in containers that you run your software in. Uh, there is also fast testing, which is a, uh, like bumping your application with vulnerable payloads, trying to find vulnerabilities. And other one is secret detection, which uh, scan your code to find Missed password and some uh, tokens in uh, like uh, missed in the configuration files. And let's just uh, talk about a little about uh, SAST, which is a static application security testing. Uh, this uh, type of testing is kind of a white box because it happened from inside out. So uh, this kind of get the copy of your code, uh, go go and uh, goes through it find vulnerabilities or like possible vulnerabilities and uh, present your result with a report. So uh, this uh, scanning is actually technology dependent. It's kind of really obvious because uh, we are dealing with a real code and the code, the rules could be different from uh, one language to another. 
And this is really like similar to code quality uh, scanners, but this one is for security only. So uh, in GitLab, uh, we have SAS tool and uh, most of, of, of our uh, security features right now, they are in um, ultimate version, but SAS is right now in core. So you can uh, use it for your project uh, for free. Uh, next one is uh, Dust. Dust is a uh, dynamic application security testing and it happened with a, a method of black box. That means that the scanner doesn't have uh, the access to your code itself, but it's rather bumping um, with request uh, the application which is deployed somewhere. So basically you can have review application or something running on staging and Dust will be sending a HTTP request for your endpoints, trying to find, trying to break it and find some vulnerabilities. Uh, Dust is present in GitLab Ultimate, but if your project is public, you can also use it. So uh, let's, get, let's get back to Alice and Walter. So Walter suggests to add Sust and Dust uh, uh, scanning for the, to the uh, Good Boy project. And uh, because Alice uh, and the team, they use GitLab, uh, it's really kind of really uh, easy to do. So we just need to add uh, templates to our CI file. And this is just like, uh, for SAS, it's just one liner. And for Dust is uh, you have to add template and the variable which uh, will point uh, the scanner to the right website. In our case, it's, it's staging. And when uh, the scanners are added to the configuration file and the pipeline is started, you can like uh, see right now that uh, the results are present in the pipeline. So uh, when uh, you run your security jobs, uh, you can find out result in the pipeline view. Uh, you can see uh, parse its report on the security tab. There are some filters for that and you just like can, can present uh, you um, the state of the project of the, uh, the vulnerabilities found in the project. Uh, another place when you can interact with vulnerabilities in GitLab is vulnerability report. You can find it in the security and compliance tab. So vulnerability report present uh, all the vulnerabilities uh, that are found on the default branch. Like usually this is master branch. And uh, it presents the result uh, that are found from the latest uh, successful pipeline. And uh, you can see is there some summary about like uh, different uh, amounts of uh, vulnerabilities on different levels, like critical, high, medium, and so on. And uh, you can have some interaction with the vulnerabilities. So, um, but most important, I like, guess is like most valuable, it's a uh, merge request view. So when you add new code, you can, if you have a security job running, you can see that uh, results are present in the merge request and you can actually fix uh, vulnerability just before they actually get to your code base and you can prevent zero day attacks. So uh, Alice run the scanners, get report, uh, she fixed all the vulnerabilities and yeah, application is secure. Everything is fixed. And she's happy, everyone is happy, and Bob can use the application right now, but no, not yet. It's not, not secured, secured yet. Because in this uh, story, there is an, another hidden figure, and uh, it's Heidi, who is a developer at Tag of War, which is an application that uh, used for Good Boy. And uh, this happens that uh, Tag of War is vulnerable and this means that uh, good boy is also vulnerable and uh, there is a tool for fix such vulnerabilities and this is dependency scanning so dependency scanning in the part of composition analysis and uh, it can be used not only for uh, 
fixing security uh, vulnerabilities, but we'll talk about this uh, particular aspect right now. So uh, defensive scanning helps to find vulnerabilities in uh, your defensive packages that you use in your application. And uh, water software usually uh, tend to have a lot of dependencies, uh, especially if we talk about some JavaScript. So this is really popular. Uh, like there is a package for everything, like is it array or something like that. So uh, defensive scanning is also technology dependent and there is two aspects of it. The first one is that uh, in different languages and different uh, package managers, uh, the presentation of the dependencies is different. Some uh, package manager use a log file, some not, some use different technologies. And also we need uh, some database of vulnerabilities that like uh, are found in the packages. Uh, there are different um, like but at the basis for it and uh, the tools that uh, GitLab uh, use and create, we uh, have our own uh, database of vulnerabilities and we also get da uh, data from open source resources. So dependency scanning is right now is a part of uh, GitLab ultimate package. And as I said, you can also try it if you have public project for free. So uh, it's also really easy to add dependency scanning uh, to say a config, it's just one line, add this template and it will be just working. So uh, dependency scanning vulnerabilities can be also found in pipeline view, vulnerability report, but also there is another uh, special page for it called dependency list. Uh, you can find it uh, in, uh, security and compliance tab in dependencies page. Uh, so this presents uh, the different um, dependencies that you have in your project. And also it show you the vulnerabilities that you have in the uh, in your application right now. And uh, talking about dependency scanning, we also have a really cool feature called automatic remediation. It's not uh, available for every package vulnerability, but some of them you actually can uh, download the patch to resolve it or even create a merge request with it. So this like uh, simplify the process of remediation and vulnerabilities. And Alice use it and now the application is secure. Uh, so Everyone is happy except Trudy, who actually uh, have actually last attempt to steal the treats. But uh, she needs to uh, have a really special approach to Bob. And this is a really different story. So uh, last thing that Walter suggests to Alice is to make security checks as a her part of her daily life. But because she's already using uh, it into uh, second week, that means that uh, she has these checks uh, for every job that she's running, every merge request that she's creating. Uh, there will be a security check for it and uh, uh, we'll find out if this project is secure or not. And as well, because we <clears throat> have checks uh, not only for a master branch, but all the all the feature branch. That means that some vulnerabilities won't even get to the code base because they'll be remediated just uh, on the stage of the merge request. So it's really important to understand that security is not a state, it's a process. Uh, today, uh, application can be secure, tomorrow there'll be uh, some vulnerabilities, day after tomorrow, it will be fixed again, it will be secure. So uh, this is not like constant, it's like we fixed all the vulnerabilities, now we're secure and life is great. We have to check it every day, like every every minute actually. And uh, security is collective responsibility. Now um, in some big companies, there is some special department for it to mitigate vulnerabilities, uh, like security department. 
but in some small projects uh, there is no such specialist but someone have to do this responsibility and uh, developers should uh, be aware of it be aware of possibilities of vulnerability and uh, try to prevent it so this is really collective responsibility and i'm really happy that uh, GitLab is providing tools to make it uh, easier to everyone to have the, their application secure. So uh, security should be a like integral part of uh, DevOps cycle. It should be integrated in it and uh, CI stage, it's really good place for it because you can add the scanners, uh, automatic scanners to your second week and you can just run it and get the result. So um, we actually in a secure stage in the GitLab, we are working on uh, security tools and we are moving really fast, improving them every month and bringing in feature with every release. So uh, you can go to secure, the secure stage page in GitLab uh, documentation and you can find out uh, on which exciting, exciting new features we are working it right now. So I wish you and uh, your application to stay safe. Uh, this is looks just <laughs> somehow I, uh, it was shorter than I expected, but I hope that uh, it was uh, helpful for you anyway. So Jinko Barza. And uh, next we are going to questions. And uh, let me just ask first uh, the question from myself. So I would love to hear if anyone is actually uh, ha have security checks integrated in their project. And if not, uh, I would like if, if, if you can share the story, how do you mitigate security uh, issues in your project? So this is a question for me. Because before you can use your microphone or just use the chat to, to answer. Yeah, I must confess that so far I did not use any security checks, <laughs> but from now on, I promise I will try to implement something. Hi, um, very similar to the testing pyramid from the previous presentation. Uh, we're trying to shift things left because it's just a lot cheaper in terms of um, the development life cycle in that when the developers looking at a piece of code um, that they haven't seen in a few weeks, it takes them a while to actually get used to it again and work out how to fix that vulnerability. So trying to move it back into when they're developing the code to spot bugs then using um, some open source tools like we use VS Code and there's some app security stuff we use in there and then using, we use the SAST in Auto DevOps in GitLab um, and integrate some other things like uh, Sonar Cube just to have that sort of constant security as part of the CICD chain. Um, we're doing that at the moment and trying to integrate it more into our systems as, as demand grows. And as you say, sort of, sort of application vulnerabilities are, it's big money for people who want to attack your systems. And uh, it's an important part of the process. So yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this, you are real. Like you are right that actually it's much cheaper than like to fix vulnerability before they reach the code base. Like for many reasons, and the one is as well that it's much uh, takes more time to developer to like get into the the code like months or like few weeks after it released. So yeah, so it's much cheaper. Like 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 with the unit test. So you should try to do it much uh, like earlier as possible. Exactly, and it gives the developers more time to develop. So it's, uh, it's a double benefit. You get more secure software, but you also give the developers more time to actually work on improving the software as opposed to having to revisit old code and re-secure it. So you, you get double, double the benefit. Yeah, and especially that uh, I guess like for everyone, if you know that there is found security of vulnerability in in your code and it like uh, affected like other people and just bring some like 
money losses with it so it's it's kind of really stressful so it's it's better uh for developers time as as well i guess for developers happiness yeah and it becomes very time critical as well the time between spotting the vulnerability and getting it fixed or knowing when it actually was part of the software to begin with then you have to start digging through things and it becomes a problem for operations and potentially there's already been a breach so yeah earlier the better So maybe um, if maybe someone want to like ask the questions about some um, about the presentation. And maybe I have question related with dependency scanning. Is there some list which language is supported for for the scanning? Uh, yes, sure. So uh, if we talk about GitLab. Uh, so we have, I can actually post it in the chat, uh, the link for the documentation. Uh, so different scanners, they have different uh, supported languages list. And um, so um, I guess it will be easy just if I just like uh, <laughs> post in. Okay, sure. Okay, I see the link, thank you. Is there any question additional to Tatiana? Maybe it, it is the last chance to, to ask question. I don't know if uh, it's going to be for Tatiana, but uh, I wonder if uh, if there is a security scanning uh, regarding the uh, network appliances, which is uh, right now uh, going from hardware to the to the to the cloud and to the application, and uh, yeah, if there is something that GitLab can take part in in. in. Um, I'm not sure if I know the answer for it because we have different uh, features in development right now and I don't know their status, but we actually uh, have some tools, like we are developing some tools that uh, should help with uh, security on the network so level. So we have like separate stage called protector now that is uh, developing such features. Okay, thank you. Can you give a um, <laughs> an explanation for someone who's very new to this, what API fuzz testing is? Sorry, API fuzz testing or just yeah, the API fuzz testing. I'm sorry, I'm just on the um, the application security part of the GitLab docs, and we've used some parts of uh, the application security framework before, but not this uh, the API fuzzing. And we use a lot of APIs as part of our back end for our app. And I'm just curious as to what this web API fuzz testing actually looks for in terms of vulnerabilities. So. Uh... I actually like I, I guess it's kind of embarrassing, but I can't really like fully um, 
tell you what exactly this tool is uh, doing because it's like really, really new and I didn't check it myself, frankly, because like uh, I'm working on the defensive scanning actually. So this is my area. And uh, fast testing is basically is needed for uh, trying to like overflow um, the API. Um, overflow it with uh, like um, request and try to like break it. Okay, so a little bit like sort of SQL injection vulnerabilities, but for APIs. Yeah, something like that. Okay, thank you. Tatiana, maybe my question will be not 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 quite well because uh, I would like to ask about the dependency scanning. If you can share with us uh, what you are doing under the hood. I mean, are you gathering all information about all the packages and and have your own database and checking if the new vulnerability comes up? If you can say, of course, uh, what is your approach under the hood with with this dependency scanning? Um, yeah, so probably I can uh, I can actually like it's like a pleasure to work in GitLab because you like everything is public, so it's like there is a little amount of things that you can't talk about. So I guess an actual dependency scanning uh, project is uh, public, and I can send a link. In the chat. Uh, so basically, we are there is a um, there is a organization, uh, open source organization called Avasp. Uh, they actually collect information about vulnerabilities, and uh, you can find uh, information about these vulnerabilities in um, in the internet, basically. And uh, so we have our in-house tool called Gymnasium uh, that is based on like, this tool is like a core of the pencil scanning. So uh, we support, like we have our database. So we just like collect automatically, like right now, like it was days when we actually uh, done it by hand. So we get information like on some uh, RSS about uh, found new, uh, vulnerabilities and we manually checked if it's uh, from the uh, languages that we su our scanner support and we just like created uh, uh, this database like uh, so we created yaml files with uh, vulnerabilities and then we proceeded to the database and it saved uh, there uh, and um, then you can actually find it by by identifier and um, Right now we have uh, the team who is working on automate of the automation of the things and uh, like making processing this uh, found vulnerabilities much faster. Uh, so right now we actually <clears throat> like this uh, part of the job like uh, fulfilling the database is automated. And uh, then we have a tool which uh, actually scan uh, your code uh, search for this log file if uh, if there is no one and like for example for Ma Maven project so uh, it have to uh, get information like uh, in different ways get information about the packages that uh, you have in your project and then when we have the list of the packages we can actually uh, like make a check if we have uh, vulnerabilities for this package for this version in in the database and we then we can create the report so i hope this answer your question yes yes thank you very much yeah so maybe one not related question from my side uh, what race is your dog it's so adorable My dog is Bichon Frise. I can actually show, I don't know if you, you can see it. Oh. This is a live version of my dog. If you see him. So he's Bichon Frise. Cool, thanks.
Do you have any questions? If not, I think we can go to the next presentation. But feel free to ask. So if not, uh, maybe Tomas, could you share your screen? Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, no, for, for, for your okay. presentation, it was re really, really interesting part. Right. OK, T Tomek, yeah, sure. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, I can see your screen right now. Yes, presentation is visible too. So I think the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Good luck. <laughs> OK, thank you. And OK, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tomek Szynczycki. I'm DevOps engineer at uh, fashion app Flipfit. And I'm here today to talk to you about how you can manage your, your pipelines uh, in GitLab. Uh, Grzegorz showed some basic stuff about them. Uh, the Tatiana showed some uh, some features from uh, about pipelines from a security perspective, and I'm going to show some more examples. Um, I assume that you've been working with pipelines and have some basic knowledge about uh, jobs and the whole platform, which is GitLab. Uh, I've also created um, some posts and short videos uh, for the purpose of this presentation. So uh, you, you'll find the links at the end uh, of the talk. Uh, I want to talk about uh, four keywords, which are very useful in uh, creating pipelines. And after that, I will show some, uh, some, some examples. And uh, the keywords are include, extent, uh, rules, and trigger. Uh, the first keyword include. Uh, there are four types of, in of includes. As the name suggests, uh, with this guy, you can include other YAML files to, uh, to your uh, GitLab CI YAML uh, fi file. Uh, so, it's very useful when your config uh, grows and grows, and then you can split it uh, into more files and then include uh, include the, uh, the, these files. And there are four types of include. Uh, local, file, remote, and template. And... Oh, wait. Uh, with local, mm, you can include a file from the from the local repository. Uh, it must be on the same uh, branch, of course. Uh, so you can put the logic behind the jobs into separate files. Uh, here's an example. Uh, you can keep each job in another file and then include them, uh, and then include them. So. Uh, here we include our jobs uh, from YAML files from configs catalog. Here's the file type. With this type, uh, you can get access to private projects on the same GitLab instance. So you can include files from other projects. Uh, it's useful when your projects uh, are very similar and setup looks almost the same then you can just include uh, one template file. Uh, if you have microservices, you can create uh, a template and then include this file in every repository with a microservice. Uh, so here we want to include uh, a microservices YAML uh, file from CI setup uh, project from master branch. Uh, and uh, you have to remember that everything is evaluated uh, during pipeline creation. So if you change something uh, in this in this uh, YAML file, you have to create 
uh, a new pipeline if you want to see your your changes. Mm -hmm. Another type is remote, and with this you can include uh, a remote file. Uh, the file must be accessible by uh, by GitLab instance. And the last type is remote. Uh, sorry, the the, the last. Uh, the last uh, type is template. With this, you can uh, include templates which are shipped with uh, with GitLab, but I haven't uh, used it yet, so uh, I, I can't say anything practical about it. Um, and that's it about include keyword. Uh, with this, as you could see, um, you can easily split your uh, large file into smaller ones and it's very useful when uh, your projects are similar and then you can create a template and include it in in these projects mm, next keyword extends uh, with this you can inherit from other jobs mostly from hidden jobs uh, the job is hidden when you add uh, dot at, at the, uh, the beginning of the name. Uh, and here's the first example. Uh, we have one hidden job uh, and two deploy jobs. And both of them inherit from, uh, from the hidden job. Uh, and in deploy prod uh, job, we want to run this job manually. Uh, so you can see that you can overwrite everything what you uh, what you inherit. Uh, after pipeline creation, we'll have two jobs: uh, deploy dev and deploy prod. And because we want to run the same script in every every job, but uh, one of them is manual, we can use extends uh, keyword and inherit inherit the common logic uh, from hidden job. Um, here's another example. We have two jobs, uh, test and second test. Uh, in, the, in the first one, we have two sections before script and, and script. In the second one, we inherit from, uh, from the uh, first job, uh, but we add another after script uh, section. So after pipeline uh, creation, uh, we'll, uh, we'll also have two jobs and uh, they will look like, like this. And the second job is almost the same as the first, but uh, we added another after script section. Uh, if we want, we can also uh, overwrite in the second test uh, uh, before script section, for example. Uh, here's one important thing about inheriting in, in uh, YAML files. Uh, you can merge hashes, but not arrays. Uh, in this example, we have two jobs. Uh, in the first one, we set one variable. Uh, in the second job, we inherit from the first job, uh, but we add another uh, another variable, my second var with uh, value 40, 39. And uh, the output will be this. Uh, because uh, variables section uh, is a hash, we can just merge this hash. So in the second job, we have two variables in the variables section. Uh, and uh, according to GitLab uh, documentation, uh, the algorithm used for, uh, for merge is closest scope wins. So keys uh, from the last member uh, always overwrite anything defined on other levels. So you, you can uh, inherit something and then overwrite uh, what you want. Uh, as, uh, and we can merge arrays. Uh, here's an example. 
uh, in the first job, we have two commands in script section. Uh, and in the second job, we want uh, uh, to inherit from the first one, but we change the script section and we can't merge uh, arrays. So what will be the output of this operation? Mm. After pipeline creation, uh, the output of the second example job will be this. Uh, the script section has been overwritten. Uh, you can't merge arrays, so you always overwrite them. Uh, so you must be careful here for, for such cases. Uh, if you want to add something uh, before command or after, uh, you can always use before or after script uh, sections if you want uh, yeah, to, to add something to the list of commands. Uh, next keyword, uh, rules. Uh, with this, you can include or exclude uh, jobs in pipelines. Uh, this keyword replaces uh, only accept uh, keywords. Uh, you can't use uh, use both rules and only accept keywords in the same job. Uh, and using rules, you can uh, provide two attributes, uh, when and uh, allow uh, failure. And, yeah, and rules are evaluated in order until uh, the first match. Uh, when matched, the job uh, is either either included or excluded from the pipeline. So here we have uh, one job build and two rules. Mm, if the pipeline is created on master branch, then the first rule evaluates to true. Uh, and we spawn the job. Uh, we also changed uh, when keyword from default uh, on success to always, so we always spawn the job on master. And um, if you uh, if you push your changes on, let's say, uh, develop um, branch, uh, the first rule the first rule evaluates uh, to false, so we go to the to another rule, and because we don't check anything in this rule. Uh, it always evaluates the true, so we can treat it as a default default one. Uh, and then the job is uh, manual and it, it can fail. Yeah, and within rules, uh, you can use uh, these clauses. Uh, if statement if is uh, self-explanatory, I think, uh, with changes, you can check if files have been changed and exists uh, checks if uh, there are specific files. Uh, so um, I, I've shown, uh, I've shown uh, you an example with if before, so let's check other clauses. Um, one of them is changes. Uh, using this keyword, it's possible to create uh, or hide uh, a job based on a, on an array of files or catalogs. In this example, we want to run this job only when something uh, has been has been changed in Docker file or uh, or in app catalog. So if there is no change or change is only uh, in the readme file, for example, then the job will not be spawned. And another keyword is exists. Uh, it's similar to changes keyword. Uh, it evaluates to true when there is such, uh, when there is a, a such file. So in this example, the job will be created if there is Docker file in, uh, on this branch. Uh, and and you can mix these clauses, so you can use all of them within one rule. Uh, in this example, the first rule, uh, the first rule checks uh, if it's a master branch, 
and if there is a change in docker file uh, so if you push your code on master and there is a change in docker file then the job will be spawned um, if you push something on master branch but there is no change in docker file then then the first rule uh, evaluates to false and we go to the second rule the default one and the job will be manual and next keyword trigger and with this uh, with this keyword you can define a downstream pipeline uh, trigger uh, there are two types of downstream uh, pipelines uh, with the first type you can trigger a pipeline in another project and with the second type you can trigger child or sub pipelines uh, but in the same in the same project uh, here's uh, here's an example of a trigger job. Uh, you have to set a path to the project, and uh, optionally, you can provide the name of the of the branch, uh, and you can choose a strategy. Uh, by default, the trigger uh, job uh, job um, doesn't wait for the downstream pipeline uh, to complete. Uh, it completes with with the success code, uh, with the success status, uh, as soon uh, as the downstream pipeline is created. So, if you want to wait for the downstream uh, pipeline, uh, you must set the strategy keyword uh, to depend. Uh, this way, the trigger job will will behave like uh, like a normal job. And in this example, we want to trigger pipeline in my project. Uh, uh, repository on master branch uh, and we want to wait for this uh, for this pipeline um, in child in child pipelines you need to use uh, include keyword so you can include files from the same repository or from another one uh, you can also use strategy a keyword as in multi-project uh, pipelines and uh, using, uh, using child pipelines is useful when your pipeline is complex and you want to split it into sub-pipelines. Uh, for example, if you have many jobs with tests and you don't, uh, you don't want to show them in a pipeline, uh, the jobs, uh, you can run them as a child pipeline. So in, in the pipeline, you will see only uh, some jobs and the sub pipeline, for example. Okay, so uh, let's see some more advanced examples. Um, in in this example, let's say that we have many microservices. Uh, they are written in the same language, and we want to build an image, test it, and then deploy the service. So we can create a template file uh, in a different repository and then include it uh, in every microservice project. Um, so on the left, uh, we have an example of the template file. Uh, we have uh, three, uh, three jobs, builds, test, and deploy. Want to build an image, then test it, and then deploy it somewhere and on the right um, we include this file in every microservice uh, you have to remember that you can always uh, overwrite what you uh, what you include what you what you want as you can see on the right column where we overwrite uh, repo url we defined it here but for specific microservice, for instance, we uh, we use uh, another repository so we can we can uh, change it. And if you, if you don't have tests in some projects, you can always overwrite the script section here uh, in in test job and print some info like please test for instance. 
instead instead of uh, running this this command. Um, uh, here's an example of uh, with accents keyword. Uh, we have two jobs. Uh, we inherit from the dot deploy uh, job, and for each job we change the env variable. Um, and for the prod, uh, we want to run this job manually, and uh, and after the deployment to production, uh, we want to send some info Slack, for for instance. Mm. And here's the the next example, the, the last one. Let's say that we have our our microservices, and because we have a lot of them, uh, we want to deploy them from one place uh, instead of of clicking on each deploy job in every repository. Uh, so we can create a repository from which we want to trigger deploy jobs. Um, Uh, in trigger uh, in trigger project uh, we can create a pipeline with manual jobs which are responsible for triggering pipelines uh, in our microservices uh, we also use the extends keyword here so for each microservice we want to uh, for each microservice we want to uh, uh, we need to create a job and uh, we want to spawn a pipeline in specific project on on the master branch and we want to wait for uh, for this pipeline so by clicking uh, on trigger job in this project we will spawn a new pipeline in a specific uh, another project but here's one problem we will spawn a, a whole uh, a whole pipeline, but we only want to deploy the specific uh, service. Uh, so, and let's say we have some some jobs there. So, but we want to uh, um, to spawn only uh, one specific job. Uh, so we can fix fix it using rules keyword in microservice uh, in microservice pipelines. Uh, yeah, so in our uh, microservices, we can add uh, rules sections. Let's say we have uh, two, two jobs, build and deploy, but we don't need to build the, uh, the image again. We, we just want to, to deploy the, uh, the, the microservice. In build job, uh, if pipeline is created by triggering, uh, this if uh, uh, in the in the rules uh, section, it will evaluate to true, and because we set when to never, uh, the job won't be spawned. Uh, additionally, we want to build the image automatically on master branch or uh, or develop branch. Uh, the second rule. Uh, otherwise, the, the the last the last rule, the job should be manual. And and deploy job should be always spawned uh, if the pipeline is triggered uh, on master branch. Uh, the first rule, if it's not triggered. Uh, but it's a master branch, so let's say that there was a merge request or something. someone uh, committed to, 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 to the master. Uh, the job should be manual then, and otherwise we want to hide this job. So, for instance, we, we, uh, we don't want to deploy on production from feature branch or, or something like that. Uh, so this way, uh, in our mother <laughs> repository, uh, clicking on trigger job for a specific uh, project, uh, we will trigger a pipeline in this project 
but in this pipeline we will only see a deploy job and uh, yeah that's that's the end of the presentation uh, i showed you how you can manage your pipelines using these four uh, keywords uh, include extends rules and trigger and i hope that it was useful and yeah, there are some QR codes and links to my uh, to my uh, other resources. So if you want to see more examples, please please use them. And yeah, that, that that's it. I have also a question. Uh, uh, when adding uh, when adding multiple files using uh, the include file uh, syntax. You had to sp you had to sp uh, specify the project and ref for each file. And some time ago, uh, GitLab has changed it, and now you can provide a list of files all all at once, uh, as you can see on the screen. And the question is: in in which release has it been added? It may be hard question, but you can answer via chat or via your microphone. Uh, ah, okay. So it's how uh, much do you have? It's maybe, too difficult. I, 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 I can. Maybe I have you have some one. hint. Let, let's try with some hints. Oh, so maybe I. Uh, I have another question. <laughs> then maybe it's too too difficult. Um, but sorry, can I guess? I don't know. I don't know the answer. But like, uh, can I answer it? Try to answer it. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So I guess it's like this. Is, looks like uh, some breaking change, and it's be possible to add it only in a major release. So my guess is thirteen dot zero. It was, it was in this year, in the last three months. So maybe. It... Uh, so so in this case, I don't know. As a hint, you can go to GitLab Docs and uh, Google for this keyword, and you have version history button there, and you can uh, click it to see when it has been added. Oh, yeah, so you can uh, see your uh, Google skills. Finding things in documentation is a very important skill, so it's always a good opportunity to practice it. Tomasz, we have got one answer on chat. Is it right? Yeah, yeah, it, it was uh, first in that six. Okay, so we have got answer. I will contact with, with you then, then. Thank you very much for, it was, I think it was quite hard question, but we have got answer. That's nice. I had a little advantage. I was on that issue the other day, looking at the <laughs> the same same problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had that in my history. Okay, then maybe we have some question to Tomas about the presentation and his spoken.
Maybe uh, it's uh, not necessarily a question about the advanced rule set, um, but when would you tend to use the before and the after scripts instead of just the scripts? Because you mentioned that you can't merge arrays when you're extending uh, the pipeline. Um, is that when you would use the before and after scripts to avoid that issue? OK. So for example, in in our template, we use before section uh, when we want to, we, we have a template file and some projects uh, don't have tests yet, uh, but we include this, uh, this template file in every project. So if there are no tests, the, the pipeline will be, it will be broken. So, um, so for for this reason, we use before section for in um, in tests uh, in test job. So uh, we um, we download the image in before section script. But if you don't have but in in your project, you have to add script section and uh, add a comment for for uh, for uh, to, to spawn the, uh, the 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 image with tests. So if you if you don't do that, then uh, the the job uh, won't be spawned. Okay, great, thank you. Any, any other question? Or... Small question, small amount of question means everything was clear or nothing was clear. So I hope I <laughs> <Yeah, clear. laughs> Okay, if we don't have any questions, I would like to thank you very much for for your participation for our prelegence. It was really, really interesting uh, prelection and informative. I would like also uh, invite you to the next uh, meetup. I we don't have information yet what in what uh, time it will be and and uh, what exactly we will try to to show you but please uh, keep on what what is going up on our meetup group and and thank you very much thanks for organizing the event and thank you all for participating